for those of you who know me, you might hear the same old story. But for the sake of those who haven't yet heard the story, let me elucidate some color into these very, very sketchy outlines. As we had discovered, I, I came into contact with the Word of God. Look, my cheat notes have fallen. And see how colorful they are? God is not without color. I uh, had my introduction to the faith from my grandfather, Yusuf, Joseph. He was a bull, a bick of a man. He was born in Poland. He came to the faith through what you might call supernatural, extraordinary means. He was sitting by a river, the river Book in Polish, which is ironic because it's the river God. And he was reading God's word, the book of Revelation, and he was trying to understand what the passages were talking about. The year was about 1936. As he was going through the word, suddenly someone appeared and the man said to him, what are you reading? And my grandfather said, I'm reading the book of Revelation, but I just, I can't understand what it means. So the man then started to explain, exegete, open up God's word to him. And in beautiful colors, explain to my grandfather what the passages meant. And as the word says, the light dawned upon him. And as he turned to thank this person, they'd gone. They'd gone. He raced back to his village and he started to tell everyone what he'd experienced. The whole village was converted. A little further down was another village where my grandmother, my babcha, was. They ended up getting married, obviously. But the fact is that my grandmother down the road was 16 at the time, and she was already a coal porter. Her and her younger sister, Kaja, who was 14, would go house to house, opening up God's word to people. You can imagine now Poland, just before the Second World War, very strong Catholic, they still are, very set in their ways, and yet whole villages were being opened up to God's word. Whole villages were being converted. There was a crisis looming and people were hungry and thirsty for God's word. The war broke out. And if you know history, Poland was cut in two. The Nazis took the, uh, the West and the Russians, the Soviets took the East. And if you were wise enough to know which way to go, you went into some form of camp. So my granddad ended up on the west side with the Nazis in a camp, and he managed to escape three times. The stories he shared with me when I was growing up with him on a farm just north of Maitland, a little town called Rosebrook, the Hunter River sort of snakes its way around there. We would get up in the morning at about five, take out a few cows, line them up in the barn. My job, how I, the, the best job in the world, hold the candle. Not too close to the cow, but just enough so he could see where he was shooting the milk. And uh, for those of you who have... Ever milked a cow? Anyone milked a cow before? Oh, the fun of, the joy of holding that in your hand. Oh, it's, a, it's called a prishnitz. 
And, you know, five years old, you're looking at this thing that's producing the milk and you're going, what, what a wonderful thing. It's like, Jojo, can I try? He goes, Kotek, please, just please be patient. Half a bucket later, Jojo, can I have a go? Treke, Kotek, Treke, Treke, please Treke. Finally to the point where of exasperation, a five-year-old has enough. And you grab this thing and it's weird and soft and malleable. He goes, Nyerupta, don't do this. You need to be gentle but firm. And thus my introduction to paradox. Gentle but firm. Pull, don't squeeze. Oh, the victory I had. Until we fill the bucket up. And that was my job in the end, to fill the bucket up. The joy that you would have taking this bucket of milk back, warm milk. None of this pasteurized stuff in the fridge that come on, rubbish. Nice, big, warm bucket. Take it to the kitchen when my babcha was there making the breakfast, singing the hymns, into the kitchen. Hi, babcha. Babcha was always kind of stern, you know. Zawashtam. Stick your head in the bucket and lick it. I hear those voices. It made sense. A cat does it. <laughs> so you put your head in the bucket and you start licking it. Blip, blip. Mew. <laughs> face full of milk. Nothing, I think, nothing's worse than that, having milk on your face. Or on your clothes for three days. Nothing's worse. Growing up on the farm in Rosebrook was life-changing. In the evenings, I would sit on my grandfather's knee and he would open up the Word of God. And none of this like, Kotek, let me open up to you the story. What a story. David and Goliath. <laughs> no, no, no. He'd open up passages from Ezekiel. 37. Dead bones. And we would read it verse upon verse upon verse. And every verse he would say, what do you think that says? Brothers and sisters, let me tell you this. Don't think for a second the little ones don't know. Don't think for a second the little ones don't understand. When Jesus says, suffer them to come unto me. Race them to Jesus. That's where you take off that little leash that you have on them. And not too far. I do good then. When they want to go to Jesus, send them and send them quick. Let them race to Jesus and sit at his feet. Let them run and jump into his arms. Line upon line, precept upon precept. I spent the better part of three or four days thinking, what am I going to share this morning? I've had a long life. When I say long, not as long as some. My hair is getting grey though. I'm excited about that. I, I know, what no? Oh, I love, I love the, I love the grey. Oh, someone said to me once, oh, you look very distinguished. Oh, I'll take that. I'll take that. No one says to me, you look handsome, which is you kind of go, I don't know, that's weird. I have a wife. <laughs> Thank you. When they say distinguished, why you have gray hair? Oh, praise the Lord, gray hair. In the presence of men that we cannot learn in the presence of the living God. Nothing. God reveals what we need to know. Yes, yes, it's great to sit and fellowship and talk and open up spiritual bread, break it. Yes, absolutely. 
But to take everything that people say, seven steps to a better you. Let me tell you, brother, five steps to a more complete you. You've got to have 20 steps to... And we read books about the Bible and not the Word of God. This is a problem. The plain testimony oh, is a problem. It's a problem with people. So as I sat there with the pen, I love my pen. I don't like this tick, 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 tick nonsense. And you're halfway through it and it crashes. And you spend four hours trying to find it and not enough time back in God's word. Yesterday, who was here for the forgiveness? Oh, wow, did I need that. Did I? As a new pastor, I need forgiveness because I'm new. I've got my old plates on. There's a lot of expectancy. But I know this. There is a sure foundation. Isaiah 28, 16 says there is a sure foundation. That is Jesus. He is the precious cornerstone. So this is about shaking, waiting, and standing. Heavenly Father, as we open up your word, let us hear your voice clearly. Please invade our hearts, Lord. We invite you in gladly, cheerfully, Lord. And as we pray for the Holy Spirit to come, let us realize that John 16 tells us the Holy Spirit isn't there to give us happy, clappy, joy, joys all the time. Yes, Lord, it's wonderful to be in the joy of the Lord. That is our strength. But we need to be reminded and convicted of our sin, of our true state, so we could race to the cross of Calvary. Even this morning, Lord, let us unpack everything at your, at your feet. We lay all burdens there, Lord. We look up to see what you have done, nailed to that tree. And thank you that we can then rush to an empty tomb because you are alive. Help us, therefore, Lord, to live today by hearing your word in Jesus' name. The beautiful words that Jesus uses when he walks up to his disciples and he says, who do you say that I am? Because people have this, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. And we know that the best sermon you can ever preach is the life of, that you live. Who do you say that I am? People might have a perception. They think they know me. Oh, my wife knows me. If you want to know about me, go to my wife. She'd be more than happy to tell you everything. God bless her. But why do we want to go on in our life inquiring others, asking others, about Jesus when we have an experience right here in these beautiful pages. This book is called The Word of God. We are simply a voice crying in the wilderness. God is the Word. Jesus is the Word. When we open our mouth to speak about Him, He comes out. It's evident Do you want to hear directly from the mouth of God? Do you want to hear God speak to you plainly and clearly? Because these are the words of my testimony. The last few years since I came to Avondale. In fact, when I was journeying to take my oldest son, who was about eight at the time. First marriage didn't go too well. Son of the times. I was taking him back Sunday afternoon and as clearly as you can hear my voice, I heard the Lord say to me, you're going to Avondale. And as I'm driving, I I looked at my son and I said, did you hear that? And he looked at me and said, what? And he had a little lift at the time too. What? Did you hear that voice? No. No. I think God wants me to go to Avondale. What's Avondale? 30 seconds might have transpired and my phone went off. Message. Beep, 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 beep. Like all good people, we look at it. 
We don't respond, of course, that's illegal. I looked at it and it said, <laughs> yes, brother. But this is 2008, so I don't think it was that illegal. Anyway, I've looked at it and the words on the screen said this. I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I believe you should go to Avondale. That was from a great, great friend of mine. And I have many friends who aren't Adventists. Actually, to be honest with you, I have more friends that aren't Adventists. I'm half Greek, half Polish. I'm a greasy Pole. (laughs) My grandmother once said to me, there's no salvation outside the Polish church. (laughs) I could tell you more stories about that too. The Greek side of the family didn't take with religion. They have it on their flag. And woe betide the person that knocks on the door and tries to take them away from their orthodoxy. But this is from my Irish friend, good old strong Irish Roman Catholic. You just hear his voice, Michael, I believe you should go to Avondale. You have, you have the potential to become a pastor. I don't know why I'm telling you this because I'm Catholic. His words rung out. I had to pull over, look over this, and I've showed my son. He's gone, is that God? So, yes, I think so. The hardest thing I had to do was, was to pack the family to go. Now, we were inspired to go. God was leading. God was moving. And every time we had, a, we had an obstacle, God was taking that out of the way. It was providence, providence leading. But it was a hard thing to leave my eight-year-old behind. Jeremiah 33, 2 and 3 says, Thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. So I did. Called upon the name of the Lord. Lord, lead, guide, help. When I was five, There were two things my grandfather said. He goes, you're going to become a preacher or a teacher. And that was burned into my conscience. And even though later on, at some point, as it does with peer pressure, we're trying to, I don't know, you had daddy issues, you wanted to impress one of the parents, you did everything you could to get their attention, good or bad. And I left the good fight and pursued a career in football. But that wasn't the call. It shall come to pass, before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. We came up, my wife, Joanne, at the time we had two other kiddies, Genevieve, Jonathan. We met up with a friend of mine, Carlos, and his wife, Rachel. We stayed there for a few days. They did my introductions to Avondale, met uh, Professor Rowenfeld, the faculty, very welcoming. I felt at home. I felt at home. The first six months were just incredible. Oh, life was un- unbelievable. Learning, just the, drinking from the fountain. Wow. But as soon as a crisis hit, oh, the foundation wasn't too, uh, too strong. It's funny, they say, come and have the Avondale experience. That there should be at the bottom there, like with all things, terms and conditions apply. How many of us get that app out? It's like, beep, beep, beep. oh, look. Uh, what's that? I have terms and conditions before I upload. Okay, what's that? 25 pages, whatever. 25 pages of terms and conditions. Who's going to read I started that? looking into that word foundation. You know what I found? Foundation is a charity you bring up, you make. A foundation where you get a lot of money. Shane Warne, foundation. Yeah. The other foundation is when women stand in front of the mirror and put a face on over their face. And there are times I look, and my daughter's in that 12 now, so she'll, you know, put lipstick and, you know, every eye makeup, and and she'll walk out. What do you think? Babylon. Go back. Go back. You're beautiful. Without the face on the face. I'll do this. Setting up a foundation isn't easy. A real solid foundation, you need these things. You've got to check if you have the right tools. For those of you who knows how to build, come on, hands up. 
Yes, I have a hammer and a saw and some nails. Look out. My wife's the handyman. I'm the cook. That's how it works in my family. Okay? I, I, cooking for me is cathartic. It's releasing. I put my Greek music on and I say, and you walk and you, oh, what are you cooking? Out. Get out of the kitchen. Build something, honey, here. Go. Nuts. And she's occupied. Here, kids, Lego. Good night. Oh, the life. No one needs computers or TVs. Don't need them. You need to clear your sight. You have to get rid of all the baggage that's around there. My wife is an excessive hoarder. And there's a good reason for that. For many, many years, if you're a student, you need to have things that you don't necessarily would have normally, if you're normal. So, oh, what? Honey, what? This sales special. Really? Do we need it? No. Fine. I don't care. Why are you bothering me? Because it's on special. Fine, darling. Take it. Buy it. I don't care. Fill the house up with things you don't need because just in case you might need it. Woman logic. No. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay. So these things did come in handy. Living on a student budget, all of a sudden you got a birthday party. The wife's covered, man. She is visionary. She has these things. The pioneer. I want to get a skips bin and chuck everything in. For me, I don't like clutter. I don't like looking at things. I like sparseness, space. I'm a big man, you know. I like to have space where I can move and knock into things. Number three, you need to position your building to specification. You need to mark it out. You need a clear delineation And then set. We have the law and we have the gospel and in the middle of that is Jesus Christ and his righteousness. He is the cornerstone of our foundation. Amen? Lastly, you need parallel lines. (laughs) I remember my granddad putting up a fence. It was a long fence. This is a proper like cow fence. Took him weeks. But I tell you, he did not spend one second more or less on digging those holes and putting those poles in. He just knew how to line things up. Everything was done meticulously. And that's how he studied God's word. And that's how his life was. Line upon line, precept upon precept. You're not sure about something? Wait. Don't rush ahead. Understanding our faith and the importance of our faith is essential to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. But we need to know, A, where we came from and who we came from how we got here. We need to know where we're at and why we're there. And we need to know where we're going and how we're supposed to get there also. Who's ever seen the whole thing? There's a a sign like Kirk's Lemonade and it has EST and then a, a year. What's that EST mean? What a wonderful world. Go and get a lexicon and see what that word means. Established. When someone says to me, you're, you're handsome or you're, you're dignified or you're dapper, and I think, yeah, I want to be established. 1844, we started to think about what, what just happened there. 1863, guess what? We were established. Who is knocking down the foundations? 1863 till today is a long time. We sit there, we've got a new idea. I have an idea. Let's knock down the foundations. We'll start again. Bad idea. The church was established to proclaim the everlasting gospel. Don't be knocking it down. Abraham was called to leave. He took everyone he could for just a little piece of a promise. A little piece of a promise. And he wasn't the only one. Jacob did the same thing. Claimed the promise, took his whole tribe. Moses claimed the promise, took the whole tribe. Joshua fulfilled the commission. But then the children started to do what was right in there. Ah, hello, there it is. I have an idea. God has the ideas. We're the builders. We start building on his ideas. 
We're kind of living in a contra world, a contra situation where you have two beliefs, two opinions, this whole pacification of tolerance. I'll respect yours, you respect mine. The Bible doesn't say that. I remember there's this big mountain and two altars. You hear what I'm saying, right? There is one altar, one king, one Lord. And we're all to have the same mind. As I said, the first semester was marvelous. By the second semester, I started to see two altars. My my foundation wasn't too strong, granted. It was terrible. When the shaking started, the knees started to collapse as well. I had a a, a motorbike accident before I came up. Um, Bone on bone. For those of you who have experienced that wonderful pleasure of bone on bone, you know what I'm talking about. And when it doesn't get treated, it starts to affect your head as well. And so in order to be able to walk and exist like a, like a functioning human being, you start taking Panadols, and then you start taking Tramadols, and you start taking Oxycontins, because all you want to do is function like a normal person. Well, you might walk for a little while, but the brain, up in space. So the experience for me after the second year was I'm done with theology, but I still need to do something. I still need to have an account for what I'm doing. I have to to show something. So God said, maybe you're not ready right now. Go and do some teaching. So I did some teaching instead. Dropped over, did some education, did some teaching, did some practicums. It was marvelous. Hanging out with the kids and teaching them Bible. Keeping it nice and simple. Bringing out the stories of the Bible to life. Because that's what we all need. About a month into my education, I snapped my Achilles. Oh, well, you know, I'm a man, of course. I can do all things because I'm a man. I can't walk, but I can still play cricket. So I went out, and after my first shot, ooh, ran it down the third man. And, ah, my wife was ecstatic, thrilled. Just had a newborn, Jeremiah. (laughs) And there's a husband there with a nice big gush on the hand, yeah. She didn't forgive me for a long time. And plus, I didn't actually tell her I was going to the cricket. Oh, I need to go to the library to do some study. Yeah, 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 I had to get out of the house. So when she got the call, she was thrilled, naturally. Now, in hospital, they operated. It looked fine. Nice big scar, lots of stitches and staples. Got home after a week, staffy. I'm thinking, okay, this is part of the healing process. That's all good. Went back to the hospital, opened it up again, cleaned it up, stayed in there for a little while. When I got back out, two weeks later, snapped it again. Wife was so happy. <laughs> How did you do it? I was cleaning the curtains. You know, us wogs. I can say wogs. I'm a wog. It's all right. Us wogs, we can't stand still. We have to be cleaning. We have to be cooking. We have to be doing something. If we're sitting for more than five seconds, we start getting a bit restless. You go into my mum's house, 68 years old, you can't run your hand on anything and find dust. You understand? Everything has to be neat and immaculate. Well, me, I've got this big moon boot on, and I'm, I'm trying to, there's some dust up there. I can see it from the chair. She wasn't happy. The pain and infection, three months it took to heal. I missed my ride. Education wasn't going too well. My mind was going topsy-turvy. In between all that, there were still beautiful, godly people who would come and visit, bring us gift baskets, Pray over us and keep us in faith. Keep looking to those who are sick and needy, who are in want and desperate. Not everyone wants attention. What we need is a kind word and a knowledge that we are being prayed for. When I walked in this morning and I heard that murmur, this beautiful murmur, Music to my ears, hearing the prayer of the saints ascending. Well, I felt like the biggest hypocrite for three years, darkest days, felt completely cut off. And yet the words of the Psalms, they're not all uplifting, are they? They're not like, praise the Lord, oh my soul. I mean, 
there's some really dark Psalms in there. So God gave me an angle to gravitate back to his word again. Psalm 116 says, I love the Lord because he has heard me. He has heard my cry for mercy. And because he has inclined his ear to me, I will always call upon him. When you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be, amen, amen. So I kept on calling and crying and calling and crying and I stopped the ministry, stopped the teaching to just stop my brain from shutting down. I started spending time back in God's word to establish that foundation. The shaking stopped. And now God said, are you ready? I said, oh Lord, am I ready? He goes, good, wait. Oh no, 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 Lord. Woo, I'm ready. Put that on me. Let me go to, wait. Have you heard God's voice say to you, wait? And you're like, no, 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 no. Come on now. And God says, come here. My hand is not short. I tell my kids that all the time. Try and take a step out. The Lord's hand is not short. He grabs you, pulls you back. He has to. The danger's ahead. Well, it came to pass. That had healed. This was unbearable. There was no end in sight. I had three doctors that I saw who said to me, your knee is finished but you're not going to be operated on because you're not even 40. You're going to have to wait till you're 60, 65 before they're going to operate on you. And I thought, what kind of quality of life am I supposed to have? I've got four kids and I've got this. You can't even sleep. As soon as you start to turn, bang, someone sticks a knife in there that's hot and goes, ah. ah." The Lord said, wait. I went and saw a new doctor. I get tired of doctors. This beautiful old man, white hair, white beard, sitting there with his fingers on his belly. Had a vest on. I walked in and said, oh, I like you. And he saw me walk, I had this, I had this walking stick. And they had a fedora to sort of complete the thing because I, I was a bit ashamed that I had a walking stick at my age. Had a fedora on, so I was kind of, you know, dapper Dan. And he goes, oh, what's wrong with you, fella? Oh, I've got a sore knee. Oh, must be pretty sore. Yeah. Well, let's take a look then. One x-ray later, we're taking that off. We're do- what? What? Oh, no, no. What I meant was, because- no, we'll go see a specialist and we'll, we'll get it fixed. I said, you just said we're going to take it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lost in translation. Wonderful man. Be careful what you say. When you say something like, oh, let me borrow that bottle of water. I'll return it to you in a minute. No, you won't. Take that bottle and drink it and leave it there, thanks. Yeah. The words we say, choose them wisely. Finally, I got my operation. The night before I got pulled into John Hunter Hospital, the phone rang. Hello? Hello, this is Mr. Sanford from Hunter Hospital. We're sorry, but we're going to have to cancel the operation. Okay, thanks. Now, when God says wait, you don't expect the rug to be pulled out from under you. But that's what happened. I waited three years for that operation and 10 overall. And God said, wait. Could I wait any longer? I had to. While I waited, I finished my first degree. And while I was on the cusp of graduating in 2013, there was a transcript issue and I couldn't graduate. And I had to come back in 2014 and finish off one subject. Then to wait a whole year to graduate. I was so happy. God said, wait. Thank you, Lord. Is there wisdom in God's wisdom? Is there wisdom there, God's wisdom? Yeah. While I waited, the phone rang. Operation came. Operation done. Ministry practicum complete. Teaching practicum complete. And while I'm waiting to graduate that whole year, lo and behold, I get a phone call from a lady called Gaylene Heiss. Those of you who know Gaylene, 
What a woman. I love that woman. Michael. Yes. Hi, it's Gaylene. Hello, Gaylene. Oh, pleasure. What's going on? Well, I've been going through your transcript, and I'm thinking, why? Why are you doing this? It's not pretty. Well, it just looks like you've done a lot of subjects, and I've gone, yeah, I have. I was bored. Well, if you finish your New Testament Greek, you'll graduate with a theology degree. What? It's better if you come in and explain it. So I came in to explain what happened. She told me everything, all the subjects that I'd done over the course of those five years. They all added up. All these ministry ones, all these theology ones. All I needed was one more degree. God said, wait. And I didn't know why. That popped into the basket. And then come, and who loves, who loves New Testament Greek? Amen. Oh, New Testament Greek. Oh, my goodness. Praxis, Ephcharistos, Evangelion. Pragmatica. Filiki, filiasure, filifki. I started to look at the language of Greek again in such a new light. It was beautiful. For those of you who are culturally sensitive to your own language, when you look at the Bible in your own tongue, in your own language, there are words in there. There are precious words in there which are magnified. The English is nice. I like the English. But I like the old English. Who could tell me what the shortest verse in the Bible is? Oh, everyone goes there. It's true. Who says Jesus wept? Yeah, pretty much. Who's got their Bible? Who's got their Bible with them? You got the Bibles? You're going to love this. 1 Thessalonians 5.16. You know when you stumble across verses, you're sort of fumbling through passages and pages, and all of a sudden, these words will jump out, and they will wrap you up like a, like a duvet, like a doona on a winter night. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 16. While I was struggling, while I was angry, while I was bitter, while I was ready to pop. These words. What are they? Shortest verse in the Bible. We always go to Jesus wept because it's, re- it's really, really, really short. But you know what? It's still two words. And it says rejoice evermore. Those words started to give me life again. Breathing life into these dead bones. But it goes on, it says what? Pray without, it builds, doesn't it? In everything, give thanks. So I start to thank God for all my illnesses and my afflictions and my tribulations and my persecutions. And all of a sudden, my problems, they weren't there anymore. The focus was off me and the focus was back on Christ. And that's the difference, brothers and sisters. We could always think about me and me. Look at your face, me, and, and get wound up with all me's. Get back to Christ. Get back to the Word. All these things, the Bible says, shall be added unto you. I had a word to this awesome man called Cale Duvall. Cale gave me a lot of encouragement during these times. Once he got called up to be the honcho at Avondale, two other men popped into my life. And God is not without putting men, godly men, into your life. One was Dave Stoichic, praise the Lord for you, brother. The other one was Pete Watts, praise you, brother. Love you. God puts men into your life to help you get back on the path, get back on the road. The foundation was set. The waiting was over. Now what was to come? The simplicity of the gospel that we stand. If you don't know how to stand, take heart. Because God props us up, he says, on eagles' wings, doesn't he? Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and be strong. When we stand, it says in Ephesians, we stand firm, holding what? Carrying what? Ephesians 6. The armor of God. That's not a light thing. Paul wasn't talking about this stuff that's camouflaged. He's talking about stuff that's bronze, heavy. When you put on, you can't even see anything. I'll put on the hoplite armor. It's heavy stuff. It's like 30 kilograms. But you put it on because it's a symbol as well, and you stand firm. While I was waiting, Dave called. 
and I got to help him out to minister at the Hamilton Church. While I was waiting, Pete came around and encouraged me to keep on walking, faith, walking in the faith faithfully, standing strong in the faith and walking, reading his word. In the space of three months, I got called up twice to do an evangelism series, one in Sydney and one in South Queensland at Big Camp. Those things happened in such quick succession. By the time I came to October last year, and I was wondering, is this my calling now, just to do teaching and preaching the word? October 28, I got a call from uh, Christ, Christ College in Sydney. Do you want to be a chaplain? Uh, sounds good. Let me talk to the wife. Half an hour later, I got a call from Greater Sydney. Do you want to come and work in Parramatta? Uh, I'll talk to the wife. No, let me see. I'll get back to you. Got a call at 340 from South Queensland. Do you want to come up to South Queensland, Pastor? Uh, let me talk to the wife. I'll get back to you. At 358, Justin Norman calls. Do you want a job? Um... Yes. All throughout the last three or four years, I've been looking and searching, and the, this is the missus talking. This is God's wisdom. Don't you dare get a job anywhere else. Honey, we need to go where God calls. God called us right here. We waited and waited and waited and waited, but God is faithful. The Word of God has these beautiful words. It says, faithful is he that calleth you who will also do it. My prayer and my heart goes out to you to remember these words. God is faithful from start to finish. When we run this race of faith, we look unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Do not stop running. And if you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But don't stop. Never stop. We have turned that bend. We could see the end. Christ is there. His arms are open. He says, come. Come. And if there's, if there's those that have fallen before you, pick them up. We bear each other's burdens and we keep on walking. We struggle, but we get to the end and then we're done. Brothers and sisters, we are at the very end. Keep walking, be, be strong, be of good courage, stand firm and greet each other, as it says here, with a holy kiss. We are living this, in this day and age now, I know, but it's, it's, it makes me sad. Working with children, great thing. Save church, great thing. But you can't even walk up and kiss someone anymore in the face like, like the wogs do. I can get my, my brother here, Danny Malenkov, and kiss him three times like we do in the old days. And they look at us and go, you can't do that, pastor. Oh, we can. Oh, it's on. We give each other, we, we, it's called the agape love, brother. It's the agape love. But it's also the philly. The philly is the kiss. It's a holy kiss. It's a friendship kiss because the word philos doubles up with a friend. When Jesus turned to Peter, he said, do you love me? He goes, do you love me? He goes, me philas. Are you my friend? What did Judas do to, to Jesus? What did he do to him? We have the opportunity to be one of two things to our brothers and sisters. We could be a Peter or we could be a Judas. When you greet each other with a holy kiss, kiss with Christ, we are at the very, very end of our walk and our journey. I beseech you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, love each other, forgive each other, and let's finish this race. Amen. Wonderful, loving, heavenly Father, words can express my joy knowing that you are our strength, knowing that we can look to the things that you have created to give us peace. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to worship together at this beautiful place. I pray, Lord, that this will always be in the palm of your nail scarred hand. Keep us protected, Lord. Our children are running amok, but it's a beautiful thing because they're joyful. The young ones are out there being crazy, banging on drums, whatever. Well, they're being joyful. More importantly, Lord, there are those of us who have shared the labors together and we're tired. We just need a bit of extra impetus, Lord, to finish this race. 
I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can give us that deep conviction to lift us up to the cross. Help us to be crucified daily, Lord, to give up everything that is about us and for you to be in us, working through us. Everyone, Lord, from child to senior, to be of one mind, firmly setting Christ Jesus is my prayer. Amen.